Hello and welcome to another video from Carl's Tech Shed. Well, as I mentioned in uh, my previous video, uh, this is one of the things I picked up at the car boot sale. Um, this is a British Telecom uh, radio paging system. Um, these were very popular back in the 1980s. Um, basically, you could uh, pick up, use a landline phone to send a message to this, and uh, this would then display uh, like a caller ID, so you could know to, to call the person. Um, who sent the message to it. Um, it's a very basic piece of equipment uh, in today's terms. Um, there was no way to reply to the message or to confirm, at least on this model, that you'd received it. Um, these, work on, uh, these worked on an analogue frequency, um, which I think, I, I, you can't quote me on it, but I think it was around eight or 900 megahertz um, analogue. Uh, and then in here would probably be a digital to analog, uh, sorry, analog to digital converter um, to convert the analog signal back into a digital number uh, and then display it on the screen. Later models, uh, then you know, they they became a lot more advanced in that some of them you could reply, some of them you could uh, press a button to confirm that you've received it. Um, but this one is a very basic model. Um, this would just allow you to receive the number, uh, and it would uh, and it would just beep in your pocket uh, that that you've got a message to have a look at. Um, it's got a very it's got a very um, poorly lit LCD uh, display here. Um, it takes a single AA battery. Uh, it's also it would have originally probably had a, a number written on the back here, but that's been taken off long ago. Okay, well now that I've taken the casing off, uh, as you can see here, we've got two separate boards which are then connected together by a board interconnect uh, system somewhere under here probably. Um, now. The only removable component I can find is this small SIP package, um, which I, I, I could only assume is some sort of um, SIM, it works similar to a SIM card would in a, in a modern mobile phone today. Uh, now it's got a number on the back, so uh, I can assume that this is the identity. I'm not sure if it's the actual uh, number of the device, but this is certainly some sort of serial number. Um, the part number doesn't bring anything up on Google, so um, my, that's, that's just an educated guess as to what it is. Um, also, the fact that there's only one screw to remove um, the casing uh, says to me that this would probably be inserted by a, by a retailer um, rather than the manufacturer, so they would probably have these pre-programmed, and as somebody signed up to a contract for one of these, they'd pop this in and give them the number that they can be contacted on. Uh, there's not really a lot uh, on here until I until I actually take the two boards apart. There's a lot of shielding on here. Uh, again, this is going to be in the analog device. Uh, everything, all of the uh, radio frequency uh, signals are going to be uh, analog, so there's no digital on here at all apart from obviously the display controller. But what I can see is uh, a lot of these capacitors, these small uh, ceramic capacitors, which are, uh, I'm not sure if they're bodges or whether it's um, design, whether it was intended to be designed that way, but there's an awful lot of them. And they all seem to be connecting onto this um, piece of uh, shielding material. So whether they designed this and then it didn't quite pass the, um, the RF standards or there was some sort of um, problem they were having uh, after they designed it and then they just, decided to put some of these caps over to the uh, over to the shielding I'm not sure um, but there's an awful lot of them um, there's also a couple of bodge wires from what I can see but apart from that um, it's a very well designed piece of equipment um, from what I can see here I mean just without even taking these boards apart I can see that whoever des has designed this has used every possible available bit of space um, they've even made holes in the uh, in the PCB and the shielding so that this could be um, configured and tuned properly um, to whatever frequency it was going to be used on. Uh, I think here in the UK it was eight or nine hundred megahertz, but I, I can only assume that if this was sold in other countries, then they might need to change that. So that's why you've got these small trim pots, um, which are accessible just by taking the casing off. Um, I'd also like to mention that this wasn't, act although this is marketed by British Telecom, um, it was actually designed by Panasonic. Um, so this this was just um, customised by BT to have the British Telecom logo on the, on the casing. But apart from that, it's all Panasonic's design. As you can see, we've just got the battery holder here. Um, there's a small screw hole there which holds the whole thing together. Um, there's a small beeper just under here. Um, got some 
uh, got small ferrite down here. There's a small tactile switch here, which I think powers on the... Uh, actually, that's not actually a tactile. It's quite spongy. Um, that that just powers on a couple of very small light bulbs. Uh, certainly not LEDs. These just light bulbs, which very dimly light up the screen. Um, it's virtually unusable. Um, but I suppose they just put that feature on there to say that the screen was uh, viewable, you know, with a little light behind it but it's practically useless um i'm just going to separate these boards and uh we'll see what we'll see what's on them okay well now that i've taken the two boards apart um we can have a look at the uh microcontroller we've got here now this is an mn1290a uh unfortunately there's very little reference to this on uh, on google at all uh, there's a couple of uh, Russian websites which are claiming to be able to supply the device, um, but there's no data sheets available. The only website I could find um, which which may have contained a data sheet for it said that it's obsolete and it doesn't have one. Um, so my best guess would be that it's some sort of 8-bit microcontroller, probably with a custom architecture, uh, nothing special. It's it's all it's going to be doing is sending, uh, sorry, receiving signals um, via the RF board over there. Uh, and then converting that into uh, a digital signal over to the display controller chip, which is just there at the top. Um, and then that, that would just throw it up onto the display, and um, it, pr it just makes a beeping sound as well. Uh, the beeping uh, is probably just going to be controlled by the uh, microcontroller uh, rather than the display controller. Um, there's also a small resistor array, that little red component, uh, just between the two just here. Um, there's a couple of capacitors here. There's uh, a single transistor just here. Um, looks like there's some sort of uh, ferrite uh, or some, some sort of um, some sort of radio frequency uh, modulation in here somewhere. Um, so there's most of what's on here is is surface mount, but there's a couple of uh, through hole components. Um, but yeah, it's it's quite an interesting. Uh, interesting little board. As you can see up here, we've got the uh, beeper, which is incredibly large, um, by at least by today's standards. Um, and although it's quite loud, I'm sure that you, you know, these days you could get a beeper of a tenth of the size, which would still produce uh, the same the same sound. Um, now on this board over here, uh, see the exact opposite. Everything is. Um, Everything is through hole, and as you can see, it pretty much resembles if you were to open up an old um, pocket radio or something before uh, you used to get these FM. Now nowadays, you get these FM radios on a on a single chip, um, but an FM radio from maybe 20 years ago would have looked quite similar to this. I'm just going to remove this shielding so you can get a better look at this. Um, you can see how many uh, trim pots there are on here. So obviously this would have been customizable to different frequencies. Um, there's a couple of SIP packages up here. Now again, I've searched the part numbers for these on Google, but I can't find anything. So I'm guessing these are probably just uh, op amps or something like that. Um, there's also a couple of crystals here. Um, this one here, I'm not sure what frequency that is. It's uh, 153.75. Uh, We've got another one here. Uh, I can't actually see that because it's on the other side. Uh, and this one here, uh, what's that one? I can't read that on there, no. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's a few few crystals. And then uh, along here we've got um, a couple of these interconnects. Now, this, these, uh, these pins here are what plug into uh, this board here, just on this little connector here. Uh, and as you can see, these four pins up here go on to here so uh, because these are where where these ICs are positioned I'm pretty sure these are going to be some sort of op amp or something like that um, we've got another component here could be another crystal uh, I'm not entirely sure uh, again it's made by who's this made by it looks like it's made by Panasonic or Mitsubishi something like that um, but yeah, overall, it's a very tightly packed design, uh, especially with all, with, with all of this shielding as well. Um, and the fact that these two boards fit together incredibly well, um, you know, you think when this was made back in the 80s, you know, the, the, the sort of um, CAD and uh, package, you know, com uh, software packages to design this sort of thing were incredibly basic. Uh, and yet these two boards, probably made by two 
you know, two different teams, two different departments, uh, one, you know, one designing uh, the analog side of things uh, and another designing the actual interface and output. Uh, and yet these two boards fit together completely perfectly, uh, seamlessly with, uh, you know, very little margin for error, especially in something this small. So I can't imagine how many prototypes there must have gone through. Um, and then probably when, when, uh, the Japanese uh, brought this over to the UK. They probably found that it wouldn't pass all of the regulations, and that's why um, they stuck all of these capacitors on the bottom. I mean, it's it's just my best guess, at least, anyway, um, as to why these are on here, because it would have been incredibly easy to incorporate these into the design uh, and just stick these on the other side, because there's already a few surface mount component, uh, sorry, through hole components up at the top here. Uh, as you can see, there's a few resistors and we've got a couple of caps over here. So it probably would have been uh, better to pop them on the other side, on, on this side. But uh, that's what makes me think it's a bodge, especially with this um, sort of, it looks like it's been hand soldered as well. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a rather interesting uh, bit of kit, you know, for, for, for how old it is at least. Um, tell you what, I'm going to take these screws off and just show you what the LCD looks like as well. Well, now that I've taken the uh, front panel off, as you can see here, we've got these small gold connections. Um, these could just go down onto the LCD, so this is like a, a compression fit onto the uh, onto the LCD just here. Uh, now, if I just pop this out, you can see the LCD is mounted in there, and it's got this small uh, rubber uh, compression connector at the bottom. Um, it's quite unusual because most of these displays, these are uh, sort of... Um, horizontal mount but this one's got a vertical connector instead so um, yeah it looks like they've, they've sort of custom designed this little bit of plastic down here um, so it's got this small right angle connector on it and then it just goes over to the uh, LCD module there and then this is obviously just held in with the two screws which I I've just removed now uh, I'm just going to show you these tiny little light bulbs which light this up um, let me just see if I can focus this properly as you can see, you've got the LED here, which is just to notify uh, that you've got a message. Um, then you've got these very small, uh, they almost look like very small resistors, but these are just light bulbs. Um, so obviously these are not user replaceable. Um, they're complete, you know, it'd be impos practically impossible to replace these if they burn out. So they must have, you know, a fair life on them, but I suppose they're not going to be switched on all the time. Um, but it's just unusual that they, you know, to see something like this and not find uh, LEDs in it, you know, which you'd find nowadays, um, but instead two small uh, light bulbs. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's 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 generally what uh, it's just very, very well designed, um, you know, to a degree, especially with, uh, you know, the fact that the two boards fit together incredibly well. And uh, also the fact that they've um, left this little IC on the side here. Um, which is uh, sort of semi-user user replaceable, or at least merchant replaceable, and uh, it's it's such a compact design. So thirty-year-old technology. Um, I mean, I know if you would compare that to a modern smartphone, it's you know it's it's so inferior, it's unbelievable. But um, for nineteen eighties tech, you know, it's it's a fantastic bit of kit, really, and uh, quite well designed as well. Well, thanks for watching. Uh, I'm going to try and get another video up very soon. Uh, I'm going to see what else I feel like taking apart this evening, and uh, we'll see what's inside that. So uh, thanks for watching.